Let's pray. Our Father God, again, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. That, Father, you have given us the fellowship and the work of your word, Father, in our lives today. What a blessing. I thank you for our teachers, for the word which was proclaimed this morning. And Father, I just thank you that you do speak to each and every heart, especially those who are saved. We thank you, Father, that our hearts are made glad and that your word is proclaimed, that it has found a place in each and every heart. Father, let every heart be open to receive your word tonight. As we go into this matter, Father, that you have selected for us tonight, that our hearts would be open, ready to receive the message, and that we would be willing to take that message out into a, a dying world, Father, and give them the good news. Be with our brothers and sisters, Father, all over the world who do not share our freedom, that are under attack, imprisoned, and persecuted. Father, bless them. Give them strength. Give them encouragement. Allow your, your loved ones, Father, who are part of your family, who are maligned by uh, the people of this world, that you would give them encouragement and help us to be mindful of our responsibilities, Father, of proclaiming and producing your word in the lives of others. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Let's turn into our Bibles to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 13, in the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse of Christ. A lot of people talk about things about the last days, and they say, well, Jesus never did this, and Jesus never did that, and he certainly didn't tell us that there was going to be a rapture, and he certainly didn't tell us that he's going to... Folks, listen, right here in the Olivet Discourse, not only does he talk about the last days, not only does he talk about the tribulation period, but he also warns us of this time to come and his soon coming. In our text tonight, we're going to see the first half of the tribulation period. We're going to look at Mark's study here in Mark chapter 13 of the first half of what I call the rise of the Antichrist. How do we know that this is talking about the last days? How do we know that it's talking about uh, the tribulation period? Well, let me show you one brief proof that this text is talking about the tribulation. Look at Mark 13 and verse 13. The Bible says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Now that's been happening for thousands of years, hasn't it? But he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's not grace talk. That's tribulation Christian talk. That's talking about Christians who will endure to the very end, who survive the tribulation. This is tribulation doctrine. This is for Christians who live during the tribulation period if you will but just survive these seven years, if you hold on to the end, then you'll be able to go into the kingdom. And that's exactly what it's about. So we see that. This is talking about the tribulation period. In verses 1 through 4, we see by way of introduction a very interesting dialogue between Jesus and his disciples. Let's start with verse 1. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. The stones were huge, several tons. In fact, they hadn't figured out until recently how they even got those stones in place. Verse 2, And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? You know, they just took the questions right out of my mouth. 
That's the question we ask today. Lord, when will these things be? And how will we know they'll be fulfilled? Let's take a look at at, uh, several things tonight. We're going to take a look at signs of deception and uh, disruption. And then also signs of destruction and disloyalty. Next week we'll continue in the study of this sermon on the, the Mount of Olives. God is warning us there is a time coming. And you and I can look at each other and say, thank God I'm not going to be there. The rapture is going to take place. You and I are not going to be during this time. However, we might see signs of these developments starting. Look around you. Read your newspapers. Watch the television programs. Look at Israel. Watch the Jewish people in light of your Bible. And I promise you, you'll start to see these things come before your eyes. Jesus said we're not to be ignorant about these signs coming. In verse 5 through 8, we see signs of deception and disruption. We're already seeing that right now, beloved. There's a lot of deception going on today. Let's start with verse 5 and 6. The deception of false Christ. And Jesus answered them and he said, and he began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. The first half of the tribulation period will be fraught with false Christ. With people who are coming. That's how I know this is not about Islam. This is not about the, the Muslims and the Muslims are going to control the whole world and, and the Islam is going to be the religion of the Antichrist. Not so. It's going to be an apostate Christianity. Islam is already apostate. The cults are already apostate. The church is almost apostate. But that's what's going to happen. We're going to see those who say they are Christ. We see the master's warning is announced in verse 5. He has a precaution for all the saints of God that are going to be alive during that time to beware there's going to be deceivers. Now, folks, you've got to ask yourself this question. Are they going to go around and say to themselves, I am Christ. Is that the deception? Or are they going around around about and saying, I am a Christian? What's the deception? Are we going to have a lot of people with like Fruit Loops running around saying, I'm like Jesus. I once was a man, but now I'm a woman. I'm like Jesus. We got a lot of crazy people out there today, folks. But the bottom line is, is it a matter of people saying I am Christ or that I am a Christian? In reality, they're not. What does Christian mean? Christ-likeness? A follower of Christ? So what are they saying here? Is there going to be a lot of people who say they're Christians? And they are not. And I believe that's the truth of it. There are going to be a lot of people who say, hey, hey, I'm a Christian. Well, I don't believe in the virgin birth, and I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and I don't believe that Jesus was incarnate in the flesh, and I don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, but boy, was he a good teacher. How is that Christian? How can you violate all the foundational truths and doctrines of the Word of God and still be a Christian? You know how? Very simple. They're not teaching it anymore. The church is not teaching doctrines anymore. I've heard people all my life now starting to say, doctrine is boring. We're not here to tell people about doctrine. I had a person years ago. We got this new preacher, and he's not. he told us, he said, I'm not going to talk about doctrine. Doctrine divides. We're just going to talk about Jesus. I said, well, you're talking about the doctrine of Christ. Okay, you're just specializing in one doctrine. Do you not understand what doctrine is? No, they don't. Because why? They're not teaching it anymore. Well, what are they teaching, preacher? I have no clue. But it's certainly not Christianity. 
So we see that this, this precaution is here. This deception is coming. Does that deception come from God? Absolutely not. We're going to show you, I'm going to show you something very unique here. That deception comes from Satan. Deception comes from Satan. Look at verse 5 again. The Bible says, Take heed that no one deceives you, he says. Well, there's going to be a deception, but in 2 Thessalonians 2.11... The Bible says that Jesus is going, says that there's going to become a strong delusion. Turn to 2 Thessalonians here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11. 2 and 11. The Bible says simply, and for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. God does not deceive, but he does send a delusion in his time. The deception comes from Satan. All right, in verse 6, we see that many will be willing of acceptance of this deception. There will be many that are willing to. Look at verse 6. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. Again, is he talking about that they are Christ? You know, I understand. When I lived in California, you know, guys are walking up and down the beach in sandals and long robes and long hair, and, and they could have easily said, I'm Jesus, and, and they would have followed him probably. But the bottom line is simple here. Is he talking about Christians saying, I'm a Christian? You can follow me. We see the counterfeit Savior. There's going to be a counterfeit Jesus. Listen, folks, if you take away the virgin birth, if you take away the incarnation, if you take away the resurrection and you take away the second coming again, what Jesus do you have? Not the one I, I read in the Bible. Not the one I worship. Not the one I received as an 11-year-old boy many years ago. But you see, this is what's showing there's going to be deception. That's why 83 to 86%, I forget now, of these young millennials believe that at least one time in his life, Jesus sinned. Now, these are facts and figures of our day today. These were matters taken up by, by the world. And beloved, listen to me. If Jesus sinned, he is not God. There's the incarnation. Boop, pull that out. If Jesus sinned, he's not the Savior. He just died on a cross like any other person did. And he didn't rise from the dead. Therefore, he's not risen. He's not God. Let's throw that away. There is a great deception already in place. We're seeing it happen within the very walls of Christendom. Notice I didn't say Christianity. Christianity is a relationship with God. It's not a religion. Christendom is the religion. It's what we follow. It's the faith that we live. But Christianity is our relationship with Christ. That's why I'm glad that when people come forward in our church, we don't give them Coventry Baptist Church. We give them Jesus. Next, we see in verse 6, not only a counterfeit Savior, but a confused sinning, excuse me, confused sinners in verse 6. And they will deceive many. Will deceive many. Many will be deceived. Notice they didn't say them all. There'll be a remnant of people who say during the tribulation period, uh -uh, I'm not buying this. I know the truth. And they're going to get saved. And we'll, we'll see how that is in just a moment. But you see, this will come about because of the great apostasy of 2 Thessalonians 2.3. In fact, Paul uses the term, not apostasy, but rather he uses the term falling away. And that is the definition of apostasy. The falling away getting away from that which is the proper foundational truth of Christianity. And all this is going to happen because the deception will come. Why? Because of the ignorance of God's people. The ignorance of God's people. My people will perish, the Bible says, because of a lack of knowledge. Folks, we're seeing churches today, they're, they're not preaching and teaching the Word of God. 
Well, we see here that this represents verse 5 and 6, represents in Revelation 6, verse 1 and 2, the first seal that would be opened. Turn quickly there, Revelation chapter 6. The opening of the seals. By the way, I think the opening of the seals is the book of Daniel that Daniel could not write down that God told him to seal up. I believe this scroll that John the Apostle writes down for us to have in the book of Revelation is that scroll that God told Daniel, you seal it up for the end. And now it's been revealed to us what was in there. We see in verse in chapter 6 and in verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, And now when I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. He went out deceiving and to deceive. This is the Antichrist. Many will be willing to accept his presentation. Next, in verse 7 and 8, we see the disruption of fearsome combat. In verse 7, the Bible says, But when you hear of wars, back in Mark chapter 13, But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and the kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines and troubles. Earthquakes is a, a good picture of, of revolutions. Earthquakes in various places and there will be famines and troubles. There are, these are the beginning of sorrows. We see in verse 7, the rumors of many wars. There are going to be rumblings of great contentions. People begin to hear, well, what's going to happen, preacher? Well, you know, hey, we've got automatic, you know what's going on in China, you know what's going on in Africa, you know what's going on on the other side of the world. Not hard with the way the news is today. But what if there's an EMP come and boom, everybody has no electricity, nobody has any ability to communicate. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be people talking about it. There's going to be a lot of people saying, hey, I've heard there are massive killings going on down in South America. That people are dying in wars down in South America. People are broke out in wars in Canada. We're going to hear people say stuff like that during that time. Rumors of great contentions and reports of grave conflicts. Millions of people will die during this first three and a half years of the, of the tribulation period. Without the Holy Spirit's presence and I believe the Holy Spirit will be gone temporarily when we are taken out in the rapture I think and the Holy Spirit comes back but I believe in that little bit of time great wars are going to break out I think there's going to break out great conflict all over the globe we see the rumbles of great contentions and the reports of grave conflicts in verse 8 the first part of verse 8 for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, nations is a good word for peoples. Remember I told you when you see that word nation, you can translate that Gentiles. And Gentiles will rise against Gentiles. And kingdoms against kingdoms or nations against nations. There will be great conflicts, rebellions. There will be riots breaking out all over the place. Imagine a world without the influence of God. Imagine a world without the influence of God, the Holy Spirit, holding back that which causes chaos, holding back the spirit of Antichrist. Imagine that. Taken out of the way. Imagine what kind of world that would be. Folks, I'm glad we're not going to be there. I'm glad my family's not going to be there. I'm glad my grandchildren aren't going to be there. I hope and pray most of my friends won't be there. That's the question we have to ask, isn't it? Logically, is all my family going to be gone? Are my friends going to be behind for all of this? <clears throat> we see in verse eight, one, uh, 8, the first part, the realization of major wars. We see the failure of dictatorships. Oh, the great dictators will lose their, their power. Gaddafi, bless his little heart. You know, I actually felt kind of sorry for him, the way they did him. 
But you know, Jesus told us the truth. You, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I watched people, listen, they're, 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 they're like animals. They were turning on. And this is the way it's going to be during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. We see the failure of dictatorships, the failure of uh, dominions, people who are in control, people who have all kinds of, of uh, influence. The UN is going to be useless during this time. And then we see the failure of democracies. Folks, it won't be a democracy during the tribulation period. But you see, those first few years, they've got to get all of these democracies and all these dictators, everything pushed aside so that one man can come out. You think the dictator would give up all that he has for one man? Got to get him off the scenes. You think the democracies are going to vote away their freedom? I'm going to tell you something. The Greeks were ready to take anybody on. They were getting ready to receive anyone. I, I re saw a lady report about two or three years ago. She said, we don't care who it is. We want somebody to help us in this mess. And folks, that's what they're looking for today. The world is looking for the one man who will change everything. So we see here the realization of major wars and there will be earthquakes in various places. These are going to be actual physical phenomenons. They're already talking about the big one is overdue in California. So it's going to be there in the Seattle area. A, a, a tsunami coming in, they say it's going to literally wipe out the city, Seattle. Unbelievable. They're talking about the great one coming down on California. Overdue. They're not talking about it's due any minute. They said it's overdue. In fact, I'm watching these scientific reports on YouTube and the guys, and we're not talking about kooks in the basement. We're talking, we're talking about scientists who are saying we are 130 years away from the great catastrophe that needs to hit, that not needs to, but is going to hit the West Coast. 130 years overdue. Imagine that. Great earthquakes are going to hit. Literal, physical earthquakes. And then there's going to be an anarchy uh, preceding phenomenon all over the world. Anarchy is going to break out. Kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation. It's going to be sad. Our family is going to fall prey to that. Our friends are going to be exposed to that. Then in verses 8 through 13, we see signs of destruction and disloyalty. This is just the beginning, folks. In verse 8, the last part of verse 8, the Bible says, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. We see the consequences of warfare is the fact that a global distress of starvation will happen across the world. Oh, by the way, verse 7 and 8 was a picture of seal number 2, the red horse the horse of war that comes in Revelation chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. In verse 8, we see seal number 4, or excuse me, seal number 3, the black horse, famine. That is in Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Global distress of starvation, famine always follows war. That's why we went into Germany right after World War II. That's why we had the Marshall airlift. That's why we had all these things happening. Why? Because the civilian population in, in Europe was starving. Folks, if we had not stepped in, Europe would have been decimated by famine. After years of war, there were no crops. There were no grocery stores. There were nothing like that that they could find food. Now you have worldwide global warfare, riots breaking out, Ferguson all over the place. Imagine what kind of world that would be. You don't think famine's going to follow that? We see a great famine coming into the world. Also a global disturbance of sedition. You see the word troubled in the Greek language means a churning, a stirring up. Somebody is behind the scene and they're stirring up the world. Something's going on behind the scene. In fact, if you'll read the book of Revelation, the Bible says that it is a contrived famine. 
Not only is it, 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 it is an actual result of warfare, but this one is revived. Stay away, the Bible says, away from oil and wine, meaning that we're going to protect that. Meaning they have control over this. So there are some Bible scholars that believe they're going to be intentional. What was brought about by warfare is enough, but there's going to be some intentional contributions to the famine by those who are in power. You don't think people will go crazy for food? If people are hungry and they know you have food in your house, you do not think that they won't rip your door down to get that food? It's going to be chaos those first three and a half years. And these are the best years, by the way. Also in verse 8, we see the conclusion of warfare. The Bible says, and these are the beginning of sorrows and famines and troubles. And this is the beginning of sorrows. We see the habitation of total sin coming upon the world. The handiwork of a triumphant Satan who has literally been given power for a short time to do whatever he wants to do to this world. And this is the world he brings us. This is the world he wants us to have. That's why people say, well, God's, it's God's fault we have all this war. It's God's fault we have all this starvation. It's God's fault. Listen, it's only just a dress rehearsal for Satan. He's had thousands of years to practice, and he's ready for the tribulation period. We see death always follows famine. And this is in Revelation 6, 8. The Bible tells us that a quarter, a quarter. Turn, turn to Revelation 6 and verse 8. Revelation 6 and verse 8. And so I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. A fourth of the earth is going to be destroyed just in the first part of the first half of the tribulation period. And like I said, this is the best time. A quarter of the earth. What could that be? My thinking is it's simple. It's the Western Hemisphere. You don't hear about America. You don't hear about South America. You don't hear about Central America in, in the last days. You hear about Europe. You hear about Africa, kings of the South. You hear about China, Japan, Korea, the kings of the East, the kings of the North, Europe. But you don't hear about America. So my feeling is the first third, first half of the first half, so to speak, the first fourth, I guess, the quarter, Half of the half, whatever, will be decimated, will be killed, will be obliterated, will be destroyed. Could that be the Western Hemisphere? I don't know. Could be. We see great peril coming upon the world. Back in Mark chapter 13, we see in verses 9 through 13 the disloyalty of families. Oh, folks, this is where the sadness comes in. In times of trouble, where is the best place to go? Well, the church is a good place to go. And I say, yeah, it is. The family of God, that's a good place. But folks, your family ought to be a place to go to also. You should find solace in your own home. Your home ought to be a place of solitude to get away from this world. Every home should be a place where you have put away the fighting and the troubles and the arguments and everything of this world away and come to your home and it'd be a safe place to live. But in the times of the tribulation period, the home will be the battleground. Look here in verse, in verse 9 through 11, a passionate hunting for Christians. In verse 9, look at the witnesses are going to be persecuted. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils. And you'll be beaten in the synagogues. And you'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for the testimony to them. We see witnesses persecuted. I'm not talking about Jehovah witnesses, but the witnesses of Christ's love and grace are going to be persecuted. There are going to be a lot of people receive Christ after the rapture. I believe there are people who are going to believe the rapture, they're going to believe the word of God, and they're going to get saved. And the Bible says they're going to turn them in. 
Then we see in verse 10, the word is proclaimed worldwide. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. I've had people say, well, that happens before the rapture. Not necessarily. Many Bible scholars are rethinking this and thinking this is not talking about even though we have got stuff proclaimed all over the globe through satellite systems, through everything. But this is talking about going throughout all the world and preaching the gospel. Maybe the satellites are down. But we're going to have 144,000 Apostle Pauls go all over the world. This happens between seals number 6 and 7, by the way. Look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Well, see, preacher, there shows you four corners. They, these people believe the world was flat. Now the four corners means north, south, east, and west. There is no contradiction in God's word. The world was not flat, never was flat. He didn't create it flat. We see in verse 2, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servant of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. In verses 5, 6, 7, 8, these are talking about those Jewish evangelists, talking about the tribes they belong to. We see the word is going to be proclaimed. Their message will be simple. What's the message of the 144,000? Simple. Jesus is coming soon. In about seven years, you better be ready. The kingdom is coming. Be prepared. The kingdom is coming in seven years. They can take it to the very day, from the very beginning of that sign, uh, signing of the treaty to the day Jesus comes back is seven years. They can focus, boop, right there the day, boop, this is when Jesus comes back. If we can hold out to the end, we'll be saved. And that's going to be their message. Again, this happens between uh, seals 6 and 7. We see here a triumphant group of people, 144,000. By the way, I believe they will be martyred. I believe they'll be killed. These men are, are men who are going around the entire world telling people about Jesus. Jewish men. The Jews are not important, you say. Oh, God has forsaken the Jews. God has nothing to do with the Jews anymore. What's this about revelation? <laughs> How do you have 144,000 Jews from the 12 tribes? Well, let me tell you. They say, well, they can't find those 12 tribes. Ten of them are lost. Jesus knows where they're at. He can call them right then and there. And folks, they're coming back to Israel right now. So we have the 144,000 Jewish men going out into the world, telling about the gospel, and the gospel is going to reach those people. Next we see in verse 12 and 13 a profession, a profusion of hatred for Christianity. In verse 12 we see a betrayal of hostility of Christianity. And now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Imagine that. Tragic. Brother against brother. Children against parents. Parents against... My child is one of those Christians. Turn them in. My mom and dad, I, I called them praying the other day. Come and get them. They'll tell them at school. Come and get them. They're in there praying to Jesus. Their hearts will be rock hard cold. Family will mean nothing. We see the betrayal of hostility of Christianity. In verse 13, the first part, we see a bitter hatred of Christ. The Bible says, and you will be hated by all for my, my name's sake. Boy, I've heard people literally curse the name of Christ. 
Oh, that so-and-so Jesus. Oh, that so-and-so Jesus. He's, he's brought many wars into this world. No, religion has brought wars into this world. Christ has not. We see a bitter hatred of Christ throughout all, though, excuse me, though all the Christians are gone. How in the world can there be Christians after the rapture? Well, you got 144,000 evangelists like Paul. Look what Paul did. One person, look what Paul did for the world. He changed the world for Christ. Twelve men, 13 men, including Paul, changed the entire world for Christ. Imagine what 144,000 will do. But you see, there are going to be individuals saved during the tribulation period. I just wouldn't want that myself. I'd rather go up and be with the Lord now. Revelation chapter 6, <clears throat> continuing in this, this likeness. This is in Revelation chapter 6. We see in verses 3 through 11. <clears throat> Revelation 6, 3 through 11. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. And another horse, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, 9 through 11. And, and when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain from the, for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? That's not church age, grace age wording, is it? And then a white robe was given to each of them, the Bible says. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants, I believe that's 144,000, and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. Folks, there's going to be a war on Christianity. The last part of verse 13, the Bible says, but he who endureth to the end shall be saved again. Those who survive the tribulation after they've been saved will enter the kingdom as living human beings. This is the tribulation period doctrine as mentioned in the introduction. This is doctrine for those who are living in the, in, not in the church age, but in the tribulation age. If you will just hold out to the end, you'll be saved. Today on the, we live in the age of grace. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, I'm glad we had one come today and say, I want to be saved. I'm glad we had a week ago someone come forward and say, I want to be saved. Folks, if you bring them, they will hear the gospel. And I can preach about genealogy and people get saved. How can that be? How can you, pre those are the most boring things. Pre I have heard people all my life, this man wrote in that magazine article in Bar Magazine saying, this is the reason why I've never read my Bible all the way through, these blasted genealogies. I preach genealogies today and people got saved. How's that happen? I was ordained on a Wednesday night. Pastor preached on 1 Timothy chapter 4, preached the word. Basically, it was, a, it was a challenge to a couple of us who was being ordained that night. And as he was getting ready to conclude, I thought, man, he's going to grab a rabbit out of the hat if he gives an altar call on this one. Talked about nothing about, about being a preacher. He gave an altar call. About 30 people came forward to be saved. Folks, it's the preaching of the word. It's not me. It's not any other preacher. It's not you. It's the word. The word convicts. The word penetrates and the word challenges people. And it will change them. If we would but just bring the lost, they might be saved and not go through all of this. Next week, we're going to continue into the second half of the tribulation. As I told you, this first half is the best of the whole tribulation period, believe it or not. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, your word is truth. Jesus, who gave us this sermon, Father, this wasn't the Apostle Paul 
that people might try to malign and try to, to disparage and say, well, he was just one of those egotistical, women-hating, homophobic people. But rather, this was Jesus, our precious Lord and Savior, the carpenter of Galilee, the one who walked on water, the one who healed the sick and brought the dead back from to life. He told us these things. Lord, if we can't believe Jesus, who can we believe? And Father, we ask that you quicken our hearts that we might see these things as they are beginning to happen before our eyes. How this matter is going on as we go through the transition between the church age and the tribulation age. Father God, we see these things happening today. Let us be mindful of those who need Christ. Those of our family and our friends who need to be invited, who need to come to Christ, who need to be given a track, a Bible, something, Father. Give us wisdom in these last days that we might win the lost. And Father, if there's anyone here tonight who's lost, let them hear your word. Let them come to know Christ tonight. Let them take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I want this Jesus. We'll show them in the Bible how they can do that. Whatever decision you've placed on the hearts of men and women tonight, let it be done today. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.